Uh oh. Oh, bugger. I've been caught. I've always been fascinated by viruses, code that can replicate and spread itself from host to host. But how do they work? There's a lot of information around, but it's all quite high level, and if you're anything like me, you really want to get into the weeds of it. So let's write our own virus, from scratch, to see how it works. Just a quick disclaimer, I'm sure it goes without saying, but I'm gonna say it anyway, this video is for educational purposes only. If you want to ruin your own machine, that's absolutely fine, but don't do anything malicious. To that end, I will be discussing all the low-level details with supporting code snippets, but I won't be showing anything that can just be copy and pasted verbatim. Whilst we will be writing a real computer virus, it will be left with several limitations, but stick around to the end to find out what they are and what we could do about them. Right, so let's first cover the basics of what a virus is, which will give us some requirements. From Wikipedia, a computer virus is a type of malware that, when executed, replicates itself by modifying other programs and inserting its own code into those programs. So we've got several problems here we need to solve. One, how to infect the initial file, i.e. patient zero. Two, how does this infected file run our code and then the normal exe code? And three, how does this then spread to other files? So I've created a simple C project in VS Code. I'm using C for two reasons. One, we'll make heavy use of the Win32 API, which is exposed as a C library. And two, not to spoil the big surprise, but we will eventually have to write some assembly. And it's easier to first write it in C and then re-implement that in x86. So let's write an initial bootstrap program, which will perform the initial infection. This will take in as an argument an exe, do something to it, and then save it as an infected copy. Again, all using the Win32 API. To start with, we need an initial target, and I'm going to use the Humble calculator, which ships with every version of Windows. For this to work, we will need to really understand the inner workings of Windows exe files, technically known as PE, or Portable Executable Files. We can use a tool called CFF Explorer to display information about these PE files, and here I've opened up calc.exe. All PE files start off with the same structure, a DOS header followed by an NT header. The NT header has two parts, the file header and the optional header. The optional header is anything but optional, as if we look inside we can see a field called address of entry point. This field contains the relative offset from where your program was loaded into memory to where it should start executing from, i.e. after Windows has finished loading your exe where it will jump to to start executing the program. Let's fire up calc under a debugger and we can see what that entry point looks like. To prove to ourselves this is all correct, let's modify our bootstrap program to overwrite the first few instructions in the entry point to some nops. These are just single byte instructions that don't do anything. Luckily for us, Windows provides us with definitions for all these headers as structs, so it's quite easy to get the address of entry point field. So if we rerun it, we can see these are now executed at the entry point. Hopefully you can see where we might be going with this. We're going to patch the entry point to execute our code and then let the program resume. But if we overwrite the entry instructions, how can we then continue running normally after our code has finished? The trick is to make the smallest change possible and then fix up that damage afterwards. In other words, we don't really want to be putting all of our code into the entry function. We want to find somewhere else we can put it and then just jump to it. If we continue looking through the PE structure, we get to the section headers. These detail which sections of the binary to load into memory, at what offset, and their protection level. The text section here is interesting. One, it contains all the code for the program, so it will therefore always be mapped in as executable, and two, it has some free space at the end. This free space, affectionately known as a code cave, is a great place for us to poke our program. So back to VS Code, and I've added an ASM file which will get built into a standalone payload blob, and modified the bootstrapper to insert this payload at the end of the text section. As well as that, it also patches out the first five instructions of the entry point to jump into our payload. I've reserved some space at the end of the payload, and this allows the bootstrapper to patch in some additional data we might need. For example, if we patch in the address of the entry point, we can get the payload to jump back there afterwards, which leads to this delightful little infinite loop. I've also patched in a copy of the original five bytes from the entry point that we overwrote with the jump instruction. So if we combine this with the offset, we can get the payload to fix up the original bytes before jumping back. So now, when our infected file is run, it jumps to our payload, does whatever we want it to do, and then jumps back and resumes as normal.
But the hardest problem is next. How do we infect other files? First things first, we need to find all X's on the system. So I've knocked up a quick C function which does that, and it uses the find first file A and find next file A Win32 functions to recursively enumerate all files on the computer. And then we can just filter for the file names that end in exe. Now that this works, we need to get it into our payload, but before we even start, there's a problem. The C code calls various Win32 functions, which are all located in kernel32.dll. But when our payload gets executed, it doesn't know anything about anything. It's just sprung into life and started executing. Like I said, all the functionality we need is somewhere within kernel32.dll, which for most normal XEs will get loaded when the program starts. So how do we find where this library is in memory? Well, let's take things all the way back to when your program is initially launched. One of the first things Windows does is allocate an object called the thread environment block or TEB. This contains internal details about your thread. The little docs that Microsoft supplies lists most of these fields as reserved. However, one they do acknowledge is a pointer to the process environment block or PEB. The PEB is a similar deal to the TEB. Microsoft are quite tight lipped on what a lot of this does. However, they do have a pointer to the loader data. This is a linked list structure containing information about all the loaded modules for the process. Now this structure does contain a name, so we could search for kernel32.dll, or we could rely on the undocumented observation that it's always the third entry in the list, preceded by ntdll and then the application itself. From here we can get the dll base, which is the address in memory where the library is loaded. But wait a second, how do we even get the address of the teb in the first place? Well, it's stored in the GS segment register. So putting this all together with some assembly, we can find the address of kernel32.dll in memory, and look, we can see the DOS header for it. Now using the PE headers we've already looked at, we can find the image export directory, which contains information about all the exported functions. So using this, we can find the location in this DLL of any function we want to call. Actually resolving this is a bit tricky. First, we have the address of names array, this contains an array of four byte offsets to the names of the exported function. So if we want to find, for example, create file A, we need to check each of these until we find the string we want. We then take the index into that array and look up the corresponding entry in the address of name ordinals, which is an array of two byte indices. So we get that index and look it up in the array address of functions, which gives us another four byte offset, which we then resolve to the actual address of the function. This sounds like a lot of effort, and it is, but it's not a lot of code because it essentially just boils down to a loop and a bunch of array lookups. So now we can find and call any Windows function we want, and I've wrapped that up in a function called findFunk just so it's easy to reuse. And now we can start to translate the enumerate function we wrote in C into assembly. You could just extract the assembly from the compiled program, but I prefer small batch artisanal assembly, so I'm going to roll my own from scratch. So I've been diligently plugging away at this coding and I've noticed a problem. I'm slowly running out of space in the text section. Looking at what I've done and how much I've got left to do, I need to find somewhere else to poke this payload. There's multiple other smaller gaps in the text section, so we could split this up and string it together with some drump instructions, but that sounds like a lot of work. We could modify the binary to create a new section, but that's a bit fiddly and I quite like the idea that our infected files don't actually grow in size. So the easiest thing to do is to search for another section with a larger code cave, and luckily for us, calc has a massive free area in the relock section. The problem is that this won't be executable, so we need to update the bootstrapper to modify the section header to tell Windows to mark it as executable when it loads it into memory. Okay, so I've now moved the payload into this new section, so let's check that it still builds and runs. Uh-oh. Oh, bugger. I've been caught. I'm guessing I'm not the first person to think of stuffing code into the relocation section, and there's really no legitimate reason to do so, so I think that's what Windows Defender has picked up on. Oh wait, Windows Defender has actually removed my infected file. How do I tell it that, yes, this is a virus, but I'm totally cool with running it? Where's the I'm developing a virus mode? So I've managed to anoint my file so that Windows Defender ignores it. I've finished writing up the enumerate function, and now I need to port over the bootstrap code. This will allow us to perform the same infection on any exe files that we find. I'm getting a bit nervous now. One mistake and I've infected all the files on my system and Windows Defender will probably then delete them. Okay, that's finished and I really want to test this out. So I've fired up an old Windows 11 VM that I've got knocking around. 
I'm kind of curious how easily antivirus picks up our virus. So before running our riddled calculator, I've installed TotalAV, Avast, AVG and McAfee. I also wanted to try Norton, but they wanted my credit cards just for the free trial. So I've installed these four AVs and if you thought my VM was slow before, it's now practically unusable. A small price to pay for presumably the guarantee that we won't get any viruses. As a starting point, I got all four to do a system scan. Some ran pretty quickly and others did not. I have no idea what McAfee is doing in my system, but it sure took a long time to do it. Okay, so I'm now gonna carefully bring my loaded calculator into the VM. And if I scan it with a vast, it immediately throws it into quarantine. So it's vital to slow the spread of the disease. I'm not sure what it's done to my system, but I now can't copy it back. Anyway, copying it into another folder works. So let's try scanning it with McAfee. <laughs> Outstanding. And another winner from Total AV here. Okay, let's just reset the VM and try running it without any AV. So it runs and we can see a slight delay before the calculator pops up, but I've just realized I've got no way of knowing what files, if any, were actually infected. So I've attached a debugger to step through it as it runs, and to its credit, Windows has denied me write access to a lot of exes. It's also struggling to find any exes with a big enough empty section for our payload. Maybe I got lucky that calc just happened to have a large code cave. Okay, I'm just gonna run this as admin to make it as potent as possible. Ah, uh, Microsoft Update Health Tools UHSSVC.exe, you've been had. Okay, let's take a step back and look at what we've done and discuss the limitations. We've patched an exe so that when it runs, it finds all other exes on the system, copies its own payload into them, and then resumes as normal. So that when any of these exes are loaded, it will then do the same thing. So our limitations are, we can only write to files that our host has permission to write to, but without some sort of privilege escalation exploit, there's not really a lot we can do about that. Our payload is too big for a lot of exes, so we can either optimize the code to shrink it down, or modify the host program to make enough space for us. We also get picked up by some AVs. There are some advanced techniques we can use to better hide ourselves. We could, for example, encrypt the bulk of the payload so that you can't analyze it for patterns. We could also get the payload to subtly modify itself on each infection, such as changing the registers that it uses so that each time it infects a new file, it mutates and looks different. All food for thought, but the fun doesn't end here. If you want to see more low-level shenanigans, then check out this next video.